Let's uh, stop and um, if you could collect your uh, papers. So just um, to repeat a little bit what we were uh, talking about um, earlier this week on Tuesday. Um, The strengthening mechanisms are basically um, a mechanism whereby we, we introduce obstacles to dislocations, to the movement of dislocations, so that we can increase the dislocation density in the material. Hmm? Um, and so the, the way you have to think about it is you, you have the dislocation which is um, causing uh, the plastic deformation moves through the material and, and meets a, an obstacle, yes? Mm -hmm. That, uh, so it, it we, we discussed just the fact that uh, these obstacles are, um, they're not necessarily, um, attractive, but let's, let's assume that, that we followed a theory, one of the theories where the interaction is attractive. So the, the dislocation um, is prevented from moving here at this obstacle. It's, um, and uh, so it will continue to move uh, where it's not stuck, yes? under the influence of the stress you apply, yes? And uh, so the obstacle will um, exert a force on this, this location, yeah? And um, the more I add force, the more, uh, the, the, the more I um, apply force, the more this, uh, this location uh, bulges out, yes? The larger this force becomes, Yes? Why do I know it becomes larger? Because the, if F is the force on the, exerted by the obstacle on the dislocation, then um, I can simply draw the force that the dislocation has on the obstacles under the form of the line energies. Yes, the, the, the line tension, if you want. So as I, um, as I increase um, this, um, the bulge, say so the bulge is smaller here, the, the vectors T are oriented like this. So, so the sum of these vectors become larger, yes? So um, at one point, um, the force is large enough and uh, the dislocation is released you know, when I reach this maximum force. All right. That's basically what happens, yes? Um, so I can have strong obstacles, weak obstacles, mm -hmm. um, and um, an obstacle usually is defined by a, um, a, a force distance shape, yes? Um, and depending on this obstacle and the particular interaction, you have a theory that describes this. No? And, and so we, we had seen that in the case of solid solution, when you add, for instance, silicon, aluminum, uh, other elements to a steel, yes, uh, and the element is in solid solution, it doesn't form a precipitate, then the lattice distortion is the main um, cause of the interaction between dislocation and the uh, substitutional or the interstitial element, yes, and you can uh, 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 quantify this um, distortion by mean of this parameter delta, yes? 
which, which uh, basically tells me how the lattice parameter changes with the concentration of the uh, solute. That's one thing. And then I also have a, a dependency on the concentration of the, uh, the solute, yes? And usually uh, the, th the available theory says it's proportional to a certain power of this um, concentration. And, and, so, and, and um, so one of the theories says it's proportional to the square root of the carbon content. And for example, in, uh, we saw some examples where the, um, for martensite, for instance, where the uh, concentration, sorry, the, um, the, the strength of the martensite is proportional to the square root of the uh, carbon content. However, I've also told you that um, we don't have enough uh, uh, theory to, uh, to work with in practice, so we usually uh, go for the engineering solution and uh, that was shown here. Yes, You basically say that um, we're going to uh, use this empirical equation that the solute solution strengthening is proportional to the concentration of a specific element and we're going to use a lot of uh, experimental data to, to know what is the strengthening per mass percent of an alloying element, yes? Okay. And we have seen also that certain alloying elements such as phosphorus and silicon are very strong solid solution strengtheners and that we like to use them, but that because of other reasons, in particular the impact that the, the negative impact of these elements on the toughness, we will not be able to use more than, uh, say, um, I would say 700 ppm of phosphorus, less than that, and silicon a max of 0.5, uh, so uh, mass percent or weight percent, if you oh. want to use that. Um, because of toughness reasons. Uh, with manganese, we don't have that problem. We can add uh, manganese um, uh, because it doesn't impact the um, uh, toughness. Actually, it, it improves the toughness. But um, for most of the elements, you cannot add very large amounts before you start other pro processes, uh, you see other processes to occur. In particular, for instance, with manganese, as you add more manganese, yes, you add 2%, 2.5%, uh, that's about the maximum people use for steels. For the, uh, for instance, for constructional steels, uh, you, you, you rarely find uh, uh, compositions that are higher than that. Why is that? Well, as soon as you start adding 3%, uh, 3.5%, 3%, then the steel becomes very hardenable. That means it becomes very easy to turn it into martensite, yes? Um, at 4%, um, the steel will be almost air hardenable. It means that any times you do a, a heat treatment, yes, and the cooling rate is a little bit high, yes, you get martensite, yes. Now, in many cases, you don't want martensite, yes, and, and so that's a problem. So you, uh, with uh, manganese, again, you, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good addition, but there you're limited by the fact that it's, um, it's, uh, it makes the steel very hardenable. So two and a half percent is about the maximum you uh, will use. Otherwise, it becomes very hard, hard in ability. All right, so, good. And, 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 and I had shown you this graph to illustrate how difficult it was to um, uh, although it, it, it looks very simple, 
to check the th you know, which theory applies, it's actually uh, more complicated in practice because we don't have, we can't have these very large ranges of C in, in, in of concentrations in practice, and um, and, and these different um, um, exponents are apply in many in many cases. Yes, these were the examples we we looked at. Okay, there's one um, phenomenon that. Um, is uh, important for you to realize is when we when we talk about uh, uh, solid solution hardening, hmm, we um, we we often forget that um, the properties of steel will vary with temperature, yes, and that is the same with uh, solid solution hardening. With solid solution hardening, you get temperature effects. Yes, and in particular, when you go to higher temperatures, the uh, solid solution uh, effect is less, is lower. Yes, is lower. Why would it be lower? Well, because I have uh, two effects. First of all, my um, uh, lattice distortion is less, yes, and second, the elastic modulus becomes lower, yes. So again, that creates, uh, 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 results in um, uh, the fact that the uh, solutes are less effective obstacles. That's one thing. The other thing that happens is that as we reduce the temperature, there is a special phenomenon that uh, occurs, and that is uh, a phenomenon that we call solute softening, yes? And uh, it basically means that at lower temperatures, yes, the, um, uh, for certain alloying elements, yes, we get an alloy softening. So the, the, the yield, the, instead of having a yield strength increase, yes, we get a yield strength decrease. So you, you can measure what is the yield strength increase per uh, mass percent for, uh, for instance, silicon, yes? And, and you find that at, at lower temperature, it, it actually, it, it's reduced and it becomes zero, yeah? So what, what um, does it mean? It means, for instance, if you have, uh, say you have pure iron, yes? Uh, so this temperature and you measure the yield strength of pure iron as a function of temperature. So, and, and this is about uh, room temperature. Mm -hmm. So th this is what you find. Yeah. As I said, there's very strong increase in the uh, strength um, at lower temperature because of the, uh, the screw dislocation, dislocation mobility it is very low, yes? Now, if I add silicon, yes, what I see is that, uh, so this is, say, this is room temperature, right, that at room temperature, I, I get uh, solid solution strengthening. So the material is stronger, yes, yes, and, and it is so also at uh, higher temperatures. But as we reduce the temperature, this is what we find, yes, you see? The, material here, yes, this is actually softer than if you hadn't put anything in it. Yeah? And the reason why this happens for certain alloying elements and others, uh, and it depends on the, the concentration of alloying element that you add, but um, it's, um, and, and again, uh, this is for BCC iron. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> Not, not for austenitics. Yeah? And, and so what uh, this means basically is that um, something else is happening here. And what is happening here, well, is simply the fact that these alloying elements will increase the screw dislocation mobility yes, at low temperatures. Yes? 
and uh, they will do this um, uh, because uh, the alloying element uh, so uh, uh, make uh, double kink nucleation of formation easier. So they, that means the dislocation mobility goes up. The screw dislocation mobility goes up. Hmm? Okay. That's an important uh, point to know uh, that uh, solid solution strengthening is, is uh, uh, a function of, of temperature, is temperature dependent. All right, okay. So now um, let's have a look at um, uh, another um, strengthening phenomenon, yes, a contribution to strengthening, and, and um, that is the dislocation density, yes. And um, there is a, a, a very well known empirical uh, uh, observation that uh, the flow strength uh, uh, is proportional to the dislocation density square. That basically means that when, um, when you measure a, um, a stress-strain curve, yes, this, yes, you actually uh, increase the dislocation density. Hmm? Dislocation density increases. Um, so the dislocation, so if this is the strain, dislocation density increases in a certain fashion, yes? And if you um, take these two data, this, this data together, yes, and you plot the stress, yes, as a function of the dislocation density square, yes, you find a straight line, yes. And this is a very useful and very famous uh, relation um, in strain hardening, yes. Um, but it um, masks a number of points. Hmm? One of the things that, uh, that happens is that, uh, so the picture is not that you go from a homogeneous distribution of dislocations with a certain density to a higher density of homogeneously distributed dislocations. Now, what, what happens very quickly with the dislocations is that they, they will form patterns, yes? And these patterns, we usually refer to them as cells. They form a cell structure. Let me show you a picture of the cell structure. This is a cell structure here. This is a ferrite, ferritic steel, yes? You, um, you can see the dislocations of the black lines. This is, the deformation here is 5%, yes, yeah, so that's not very much. And uh, you can still uh, see the dislocation. This is 10% deformed, yes. You can, you can barely make out dislocations here. What you see are very dark bands here, which we call cell walls, where all the dislocations seem to be uh, confined. And then cell interiors, usually uh, quite um, geometrical uh, cell interiors, where the dislocation density is very low. Yeah. Okay. So, in, so, so if you if you then you know by, for instance, in a TEM, uh, make the analysis uh, of the uh, total dislocation density. Yes. What you find is that. Uh, this total dislocation density consists of dislocations in the cell wall, and you see most of the dislocations are in the cell wall, and then a small amount of dislocations in the cell interior. 
Yes? And it is actually these uh, uh, dislocations that are responsible for the, the plastic deformation because these ones in the cell wall, they're basically immobile. Yes? Now, the, the, the interactions that we have yes, between um, uh, dislocations can be uh, what we have already discussed on the left, which is what, it, what we call the forest dislocation interaction. You have a dislocation on one slip plane that um, comes across dislocations on another slip plane, yes, and uh, it's prevented from, from moving because of um, what happens at the, uh, the, the point where they meet, yes? We've already seen that uh, at, in certain cases, at the point where they meet, you can form jogs, yes? And these jogs will add, act as a, as a pinning point, literally, yeah? Very str and, and if it's a, a sessile edge jog on the screw, so it's very, very strong pinning point, yes? Um, okay. So um, we can uh, uh, make sense about the, uh, uh, the, the, the the square root dependence of the uh, the dislocation density uh, simply by noticing that if you have a uh, the dislocation density of um, uh, rho, yes, then the, the inter dislocation distance is 1 over the square root of uh, this dislocation density. And, and this is this equation here, right? So it's a, a, a theoretical form. You've got stress is equal to a lattice uh, uh, friction a solid solution contribution, and then you have your dislocation contribution. And your dislocation, contrib dislocation density contribution has a, a constant. The shear modulus B is a, a de Burgess vector of your dislocation and uh, your dislocation density. Hmm? Okay? And, and uh, if, 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 if for, for ferrite, you, you know what alpha is, about 0 0.3, 0 0.35, G is... Um, 80 uh, gigapascal and B is about 0 0.25 n uh, nanometers. You can calculate this, this factor. Yes? And so you get this uh, uh, very simply, um, very simple uh, dislocation uh, density uh, contribution to strength. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, if you um, uh, need this, there are many people who have looked at these um, the relation between strain and dislocation density. So, uh, you know, you even have um, equations which will allow you to, to calculate this contribution uh, very simply. Mm? And this is an example here. Mm? Um, what is the, this increase in dislocation density? Well, um, you typically go uh, from 10 to the 12th, uh, uh, meters of dislocations per cube meters, yes? And then as you strain the material, the density goes up to, uh, so if you, you have like 30% deformation, goes to about close to 10 to the 15 meters per cube meter of material. Hmm? Okay, and you can then um, uh, just basically uh, using uh, this here, uh, calculate true stress as a function of true, true strain, yes, and, 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 and plot n values, uh, so strain hardening values uh, that you obtain and then calculate even what the uniform strain will be. Hmm? So that's uh, very convenient, all right? Now, um, yeah, and, and there is, there's some example here of, of this calculation and a, a table that gives you um, typical dislocation densities that uh, you have. Okay, uh, so dislocations. Um, now, 
the, we usually don't use this, you know, we don't uh, usually um, deform our material to get strength uh, in, in products, yes. Uh, however, um, uh, and, and the, the strengthening by dislocation is basically your standard um, uh, work hardening. Uh, but what we can do, and uh, that gets a lot of attention in technology, is, is reducing grain sizes. Because grain sizes, uh, grain boundaries, excuse me, are very efficient uh, in uh, increasing the, the strength, yes? And in addition, uh, the, the negative impacts on other properties are, are minimal. And there's actually uh, one very positive impact is this the grain size reduction always leads to an increase in toughness, yes. And so that's in many applications, uh, structural applications, um, in um, uh, petroleum and gas industry, in the shipbuilding industry, line pipe industry, it's very important to have very tough materials. So grain uh, engineering, grain size engineering is very important for these products. So uh, you can see here what happens is that in your material, when you, you generate dislocations uh, from a dislocation source, they will, dislocation will move and then they'll hit the grain boundary, yes, and then it's done, yes. Um, in contrary to a single crystal, where as you deform the single crystal, this location can move out of the single crystal. In this case, they're just stuck, stuck, literally stuck at the grain boundary. Yes, and because the sources of dislocations emit always the same dislocation, you get pileups. Pileups. And these pileups, um, um, in order to uh, push more dislocations, yes, uh, create more dislocation, it becomes increasingly harder to do this. And the, the, the reason is very simple: is because these pileups, the dislocation, all these dislocations, exert a uh, repulsive interaction on each other. So the more dislocations I have in the pileup the larger the, um, the repulsive interaction, yes? And the harder it is to make more dislocations, uh, make the uh, dislocation source create more dislocation. And you can see very nicely on this micrograph here that the, um, the stresses increase in the pileup because the distance between the dislocations become gradually larger. So basically, uh, these pileups generate what, what are called back stresses. Yes, and, the, and these back stresses uh, strengthen the uh, material. And uh, uh, we're not going to go into uh, the theory, but you know that um, the, the, the strengthening from grain boundaries is, goes as the inverse of the, uh, the grain size, the grain diameter. Now, what about the reason for uh, the strengthening? Yes, and it would seem like um, I think the the, the, the real um, interest in uh, grain boundary, grain size engineering dates from about 60 years ago. That's, then it was a big topic uh, that people, uh, you know, discovered and, and tried to work out in a big way. Um, but um, there, there's still uh, many things we don't know, yes? And, um, and it certainly holds for seals about what, what is it actually that makes the, um, the grain boundaries so, so special. In the, in the strengthening effect, because don't forget the square root dependence um, is very easy to derive from a modeling point of view. There are a couple of models, four or five models out there that uh, readily give this one over square root of D 
uh, relation, yes? But they're very different models, yeah? One of the models is that, um, okay, you have these huge pileups at the grain boundaries, and uh, these pileups at the tip of the boundary, at the, the tip of the pileup, yeah, you have very high stresses, yes? And these high stresses will propagate the slip from one grain to the other grain, yes? And uh, so that's a very nice theory. Um, and uh, there are many, allo there are alloys, such as the one I showed you here, yes? Where you can see the pileups, yes? And, uh, and you say, well, that's a, that's a very reasonable theory. However, these pileups, you don't see them in steel. There are no pileups in steels, yes? So uh, it's a, it's a, the, 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 the theory that you probably heard um, mentioned, uh, Cottrell theory of uh, a, a grain size strengthening, um, is a very nice theory. But it, it's you know one of its uh, basic uh, elements that you need to have pileups. Um, you don't have pileups in in fer uh, ferritic steels. The reason why you don't have pileups is because of the dislocation properties. The dislocation uh, properties are such that, uh, I've told you that when a, um, a dislocation in ferrite meets an obstacle, it just moves to another glide plane, yes? So you don't have buildup of these very high stresses, yes? And so um, what probably happens is the fact that the grain boundaries themselves are active in the, in, the, in the process of this uh, strengthening effect, yes? Um, and um, uh, uh, people um, have discovered this in, in this way, very simple way. They uh, plot the yield strength of a steel as a function of the inverse um, of the square root of the diameter. And they do this for different compositions, yes? In particular, they do this for different carbon contents, yes? Zero carbon, 30 ppm carbon, 60 ppm carbon. And what you see uh, is that you have um, an increased slope, yes? In other words, that for a specific diameter, grain size, you get a higher strength, yes? So that points to the fact that, it, well, obviously, if, the, if it was a pileup effect, the, you know, the, the grain boundary has nothing to do with it, yes? Here, we know that at this level of uh, carbon concentration, the carbon is in grain boundaries, yes? It's, it uh, segregates to grain boundaries and changes, this, well, we know it changes the cohesive strength of grain boundaries, for instance, yes? But it also changes, apparently, hmm, uh, the uh, emission of dislocations by the grain boundaries. So the alternative theory says what happens is it's actually the, dislo the, excuse me, the grain boundaries that generate dislocations, yes? Hmm. And, um, okay. So it's the grain boundaries act as dislocation sources, and when they get stronger, it becomes more difficult to, uh, to generate dislocations, and you get increase in the flow stress. Okay. Right, and this, these are a number of examples here. Um, I, I, I do want to point out that um, this um, uh, this equation in this equation here um, this this whole this what we call the whole patch coefficient here yes is is not a universal constant right so if you um, if 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 you measure uh, this um, uh, the slope here for different steels, it will be different, yes? Um, and, and it will also differ for 
um, for instance, here, for instance, with the composition, for here we added phosphorus. Phosphorus is added, phosphorus is added, phosphorus is added. And you see that the strength increases. The reason is because you know, phosphorus is very efficient uh, solid solution strengthening, but the grain boundary strengthening becomes less efficient as I add more phosphorus. Okay. So there are many uh, people have looked at this and there's quite a variety of um, K values out there that uh, you can uh, uh, find. But uh, here, these are for a, a number of um, um, steels, actual steels. Uh, and you can see that uh, the, uh, for IF steels, it's very low, yes. Um, and for uh, commercial quality steel, yes, uh, car basically a low carbon steel, it's much higher, about four, four times higher, yes. And what this basically means is that this is a reflection, again, of the fact that in the commercial quality steel, you have carbon, yes? And the carbon can influence the strength of the grain boundary. Whereas in an IF steel, there's no free carbon, yes? So the, the grain boundaries are very clean, yes? And uh, apparently, uh, it's very easy for them to emit uh, dislocations. Okay. And, and this is also for um, uh, the uh, hull patch equation at higher strength. Yeah. All right, so it's very, in, again, so um, grain boundary, uh, the more grain boundaries you have, the better for the strengthening. That's, that's basically the word. So um, usually during thermal treatments, grain boundaries will have a tendency to move, yes, uh, so as to increase the grain size, yes? And so uh, we prevent this by uh, having particles in the way of the, uh, the, the moving grain boundaries. Because if you have a grain boundary that's moving and it cuts a precipitate, now the precipitate is in the grain boundary, yes? Mm -hmm. um, the... Um, uh, 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 just, just this fact is enough to pin the grain boundary. Yeah? And it pins the grain boundary because, you see, the grain boundary energy is reduced by this surface, yes? Yeah? And um, so this, uh, you know, when the grain boundary wants to pass, it's got to increase the, uh, the surface area by this, this amount, yes? And that ex uh, exerts a restraining force on the, uh, on the boundary, hmm? okay? And, and you can see here, for instance, this is a, a little particle at the grain boundary, yes? And this is around the grain boundary. The, the grain boundary here is not pinned. It, it has moved, whereas at the particle, it's, it's stayed there, yes? So, um, there is a very convenient equation, which we call the Zener equation, which re relates the maximum grain diameter to very simple parameters, the radius of the precipitate and the volume fraction of the precipitate. Yes, the ratio of these two, part of these two parameters times four divided by three. And this is called the Zener equation, yes? Basically says that if I plot the diameter, yes, of my, uh, maxi the maximum diameter that I'll have in my microstructure, steel microstructure, over the radius of the precipitate, yes? Yes, it will go down, yes, in a log-log plot via this linear relation, yes, um, with the... Uh, the amount, the, 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 the um, volume fraction of the precipitate, yes? So um, having a lot of small particles in your microstructure will prevent grain growth, yes? 
Okay. Now this equation, this theoretical equation, is a little bit, uh, doesn't actually apply for steels right away, but um, if you replace uh, this uh, four thirds by 0.17, yes, it applies perfectly. And this is an example here for a, um, uh, so this would be that new equation, yes. And um, here you have the, uh, for HSLA steel, microalloyed steels, if I have precipitates of uh, five nanometers, 50 angstroms, yes. Um, the grain size, the max, I can calculate the maximum grain size on, uh, just by using this, this uh, equation. Yes, the grain size will vary from five micron max to a half a micron, yes, for a density uh, volume fraction that is not that large, yeah, 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus four, okay? And this is actually what we do when we make HSLA steels, yes, is uh, we control the grain size by adding uh, carbides, yes, in the microstructure. Now the question is, um, of course, if you can um, uh, strengthen uh, steels by reducing the grain size, yeah, uh, note that you don't have to do anything with the chemistry, yes? Except maybe add a little bit, again, this, the volume fraction is very small, a little bit of uh, carbides in the microstructure. Um, why not um, go all the way? You know, why not make extremely small grain sizes? Um, uh, much smaller than a micron or half a micron. What happens then? Well, the problem then is that you get collapse in plasticity. If you uh, take a, an IF steel, so that's an interstitial free steel, yes, and you um, look at the strength of this steel as a function of the um, grain, uh, uh, so, so one over the square root of the grain diameter, right? So what you expect to see, of course, is your whole patch equation, right? And, and this is your whole patch equation. So that's fine, yes? And there is a whole patch equation for the yield strength, and there is a whole patch equation for the tensile strength. However, you can see here that the two meet up. They meet. So what does this mean if you have a uh, stress strain where the two meet up, well, it's like, right, it's, there is no uniform deformation, yes, because that's basically, when you have a stress strain curve, so this is the yield strength, and this is the tensile strength, when these two are one, there's no more, un uh, this is uniform elongation, right? There's no more uniform elongation, yes? The material will a neck, yes? Will neck very quickly and then break, yeah? So you lose all your plasticity. You have huge, excuse <coughs> you have huge, huge strengths because an IF steel will typically have, if it's well annealed, will have yield strengths uh, less than 200 uh, megapascal, yeah? Um, you can increase the strength up to a gigapascal just by reducing the grain size. So that's amazing uh, value. But uh, the material is, uh, you cannot deform it anymore. There's no yield strength. It, there's no uh, deformation. You can see here, so this is, the, unit, this is the, the, the total elongation. You can see as soon as you hit one micron, you get a, a collapse of the, the elongation, yes? It, do, it doesn't go to zero, by the way. Yes, there's still post-uniform elongation, yes. But if you concentrate on the uniform elongation, <coughs> um, basically at, um, so this is one, 
uh, one micron, and this is a half a micron. So, so in, the, in the range of one to a half micron, you no more uniform elongation, yes? Um, so, um, right, you, you cannot really uh, use this uh, today. We cannot use this method to make formable materials. We, make, we can use this method to make extremely strong st steels, but that's it. Uh, there are ways to uh, address this problem, but th then you have to make more complex steels. Um, right, let me see. Well, I'm, because I'm, I'm talking here, the, I'll, I'll come back to this um, uh, the small, very small grain size, and I'll, I will also show you that um, uh, you do get increase in strength. Yes, um, you, in, in general, you get a reduction in uh, uniform elongation. But the other thing that's positive, of course, for uh, reduction of grain sizes is the toughness hmm? that that's usually improves as you reduce the grain size and, and we'll we'll talk about this in a moment uh, precipitation strengthening in steels usually that uh, involves the um, uh, the following so if the precipitates are are softer they can be cut sheared by dislocations yes if they're very strong, you, they're bypassed by the dislocation. So they, um, let me show you what bypassing means. Yes. Say um, this is uh, an obstacle. Yes. But now it's a very, very strong obstacle. It's, it's an extremely strong obstacle. So that when the dislocation arrives here, yes, it will bulge out. Yes. Will bulge out. And um, typically in steels, these, um, for, for, for many steels, uh, such as HSLA steels, these precipitates are very hard carbide particles. So there's no way the dislocations can shear them. Yes, there's no way. And so the dislocation will just wrap around this precipitate like this. And uh, now, the, the, if this is a screw dislocation, yes, yes, then the two arms of this screw dislocation, yes, past the obstacle have become two edge dislocations, yes. And if I look at these two edge dislocations, yes, from a point of view of the extra half plane, then one of them looks like this, and the other one looks like this. Hmm? So they can annihilate each other because they're, they will they attract each other. There is an attractive interaction, yes. and they can annihilate, simply move towards each other, and they form a perfect lattice again. Yeah, when this one meets this one. Okay, so basically. Um, the dislocation is uh, pinched off, we say. So, you, uh, so this is before uh, the pinch off, and this is after the pinch off. After the pinch off, you have the obstacle, which has a small dislocation loop around, yes, and, and the dislocation here, which continues its motion. Yeah. So this, this uh, interaction, which is very common in uh, high-strength steels, with carbide precipitates is, is, is called the Oro-1 uh, mechanism. Hmm? Let me show you, this is an example here uh, from some T TM images. Here you can see a dislocation uh, close to a precipitate. Here you, you can see it being pinned, yes. Here you see the dislocation is pinned and there are other dislocation pushing on it, yes. Hmm? And this is a precipitate where dislocation, a few dislocations have passed it, and you can see it's surrounded by dislocation loops. Yes? Yeah. And, and, and every time you count a loop, that's the, uh, the number of dislocations that have passed it. Yeah? Okay. 
Now, depending on the situation, when, when uh, uh, it, so if you can shear the, the, the precipitate, the relation between the strength, yes, the strength and the precipitate radius is given by this equation. Yeah? So this, this is for uh, cutting, so-called precipitate can be cut. Yes? We don't encounter this situation in steels most of the time. What we, m most of the situations we encounter is this relation, yes? where the strengthening is proportional to the density, or the, the volume fraction rather, of the precipitates to the square root and divided by the radius of the precipitate. So that means that um, if we have coarse precipitates, um, we get less strengthening. So we want to have very small precipitates, yes, and, um, and, and we want a, a, dens a certain density of it, yes. Okay. okay. Right, and uh, again, um, this theory is worked out and, and for instance if you would want to calculate it for uh, a particular uh, situation that, that you have uh, this would be it you know, you, you, the, the, the strengthening due to precipitation of carbides is 10 times the square root of uh, the volume fraction so that would be for instance 10 to the minus 3 huh? yes. uh, precipitate volume fraction uh, dp here and here is the uh, precipitate diameter in, uh, in microns, yes? Okay, so this equation here can readily be put in a, um, a um, graph, yes? Which shows you how much strengthening you can get from precipitates, yeah? So here is this, this equation that I just showed the, in terms of increase of the yield strength and this is the size of the particles yes and the size decreases so uh, we see that as, as the um, uh, the size of the particle decreases I get the increase in the strength yes and yes. Uh, and that the more the, uh, the vo when the volume fraction of these particles increases, I will get more strength too. Yeah. Okay. The same equation here you can present as the increase of the strength as a function of the precipitate fraction. Yes, and in this case, uh, you get these linear uh, um, uh, um, plots. Uh, you have, of course, if it has to be a log a log log plot to get a linear equation, a linear uh, plot. And uh, the region for the HSLA steels is shown here. So we typically try to achieve um, uh, particles that are 0 0.005 microns, so 5 nanometers, yes. And um, our, uh, so our density is, is typically uh, 10 to the minus 3. Uh, the density, uh, I should say, volume fraction. And so what can we expect in terms of strengthening? Yes, we can expect about 100 megapascal. Yeah? That's, that is the contribution f uh, from the uh, precipitation strengthening, yes? Um, assuming all the particles are in the matrix, yes? Uh, at the same time, we've just seen that these uh, carbide particles can also reduce the grain size, yes? So anytime you add niobium carbide in the microstructure of HSLA, you get two effects. You get strengthening by grain size reduction and strengthening by uh, precipitation uh, hardening, okay? It's, it's not the only system uh, where, we get, where we get precipitation hardening. 
um, an, there's another system in steel where we use uh, a small copper particles, yes, yes, we pure copper particles in our steel matrix, yes, to to obtain precipitation hardening, yes. This system of hardening is different from the one we just saw. Those particles, those copper particles, are actually soft particles. Yes? And the hardening uh, caused by these particles is, um, is not the aura one uh, hardening. Hmm? That you, can cut, you can cut the copper particles. Yeah. The effect is actually... Uh, it's, it's been studied in, in detail, but the, the, uh, the effect, uh, the strengthening effect, is due to a difference in elastic modulus between the copper and the steel. Okay. And uh, copper um, precipitates are, are used um, in, in copper strengthened fer ferrite, uh, but also in, in certain martensitic steels. Uh, it's, it's used to strengthen. Uh, the ferrite. Now, again, the situation is a little bit more complicated, yes? Because if we look at the yield strength of uh, a copper added steel, yes? So the yield strength as a function of the mass percent of copper, what we see is that copper does more than just. Uh, increase the strength by precipitation hardening. First of all, it leads to reduction of grain size. Yes, and you can see here the contribution of the reduction of grain size is actually considerable. Yes. Second, copper. When you add copper to uh, steel, it will form precipitates, but some of the copper will remain in solid solution, and I will get a solid solution strengthening effect. And you can see here, this is the contribution here. It's a little bit less, uh, uh, a little bit over uh, 50 megapascal. Depends, of course, on the amount of um, copper I've added. And then you have the contribution of the precipitation hardening. Yes? So it's the, the way you put the copper in is very simple. Um, you can see here that um, copper um, at, at about 800 degrees C, yes, you can uh, easily uh, dissolve up to about 1.5% of copper in ferrite, yes. And so you just, um, a, a typical uh, copper strengthened steel will contain about 1 mass percent of copper, yes. And if you quench this, Yes, you will keep it in solution, and then you do a reheating at around 500 degrees C. That will precipitate out the copper that is in uh, supersaturation, and then that gives you all these particles and um, the uh, strengthening. Hmm? So, um, going back to these uh, these precipitates, yes, the. Uh, the controlling the volume fraction is not really a big issue. You control the volume fraction of a precipitate by you know how much niobium and carbon you've added or how much copper you've added. It's basically uh, concentration uh, related. But what's important is the is the distribution of the sizes. Yeah? So, for instance, here is an image of uh, carbides in a um, uh, niobium and titanium added uh, steel, um, these very large precipitates have no effect whatsoever, yes? Uh, because they're way too large to impact the, the strength, yes? So it's very important that these, uh, the particles are, do not coarsen, yes? Do not coarsen. To be efficient in both in uh, in both situations of uh, whether the particles are can be sheared or they, whether they cannot be sheared, it's important for them to be um, um, 
uh, small, it's small enough. Um, right, so you, there's again uh, plenty of um, things we can um, um, get from theory and from uh, experiments. Uh, for instance, uh, if, if, if you know what the um, volume fraction is of your precipitate and what the size is of your precipitate, you, you, you can determine what is the distance between the particles. Hmm? And, uh, and, and the strengthening is uh, proportional to the inverse of the uh, particle spacing. Hmm? Hmm? So the, the, um, the, the, the smaller the particle spacing, hmm? the, so the, the larger the one over lambda, the larger the strength. That's uh, what you, uh, we expected. All right, so in a nutshell, um, for uh, ferrite, yes, when we look at the, the strength contribution, it's important to know that uh, we are at room temperature, yes? We are in a region where the, uh, the, the uh, the strength properties of the steel are temperature dependent, yes? Mm -hmm. There are certain um, strengthening contributions which are not uh, much temperature dependent. And which one are these? Well, so if you can see here, I can, uh, this curve here, I can uh, consider a temperature independent strength, part of the strength, and a temperature dependent part of the strength, this value. Yeah. Okay, what parts are not temperature dependent? Yes, well you don't have to worry about uh, you know, looking for a temperature dependence. Dislocation, dislocation interactions, yes. Dislocation solute interactions, so um, Having said this, um, you know, be aware of the fact that there may be, uh, you should check for uh, solid solution softening, but that's for lower temperatures. And the pyrrole stress, that's, that's the, or the lattice friction, yes? You can pretty much assume that that's a constant value. And then we have the uh, process of uh, double kink formation, yes, which is the uh, what we call the, the, uh, the, uh, the double kink formation, nucleation, yes, which allows screw dislocations to move in BCC. That is very much temperature dependent, okay. And it it's um, and you cannot really ignore it, even at room temperature, because in room temperature we're in the tail of this. Uh, uh, temperature dependent uh, part of E. Of course, um, you know, th that's the low temperature. On the high temperature part, um, what, what we see is that above uh, uh, 600 degrees C, yes, we get a quick uh, collapse. If this is what's pure, if this is pure iron, you see a very quick collapse of the, um, of the, uh, the strength. And of, and of course, that's because we are at, um, uh, in the, and, and you get into the creep area of uh, behavior. Hmm? Okay. Now in, okay, so, well, I'll, I think I'll stop here. What we'll